This program was made possible by a grant from the UCF College of Health and Public Affairs, which promotes excellence in undergraduate and graduate education, research, and community service in health-related professions and public affairs. Hello and welcome to Public Affairs Today. I'm Alicia Callanan Mandigo. We're here to introduce you to Public Affairs, which delves into topics you might not expect. On the table today, the rather sinister subject of human trafficking. And joining me today is Dr. Mark Lanier from the Department of Criminal Justice and Legal Studies within UCF's College of Health and Public Affairs. Welcome and thank you for joining me. And this is a rather sinister, dark, topic, it's whenever I mention it to people, you can see them bristle. And it's something that is a newer area of research for you that came to you through work you were doing with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So tell me a little bit about that evolution there. Okay, well, nationwide, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, or FDLE, have always had a reputation of being at the cutting edge as far as research. Um, they've got a whole branch called the Executive Institute where they bring senior law enforcement officials from the state in to give them advanced training on different strategies, techniques, and things like that. I've been teaching up there for eight or nine years on research methods. Uh, I was up there last year and, and we got discussing a discussion of human trafficking started. And they had had an intern the year previously who was commissioned to do a study on human trafficking for FDLE. And Interns were there for one semester, time ran out, she had to go back to Florida State University and they never completed the study. Um, so they just happened to ask me if I would be willing to continue that study and pick up where she left off. I knew little or nothing about human trafficking at the time, but like everybody else, I was intrigued and shocked and dismayed by the topic. So I started looking into it. Uh, a month later, I went back and told them you know, that I'd agree to help them with it. And it's kind of taken off from there and it's, it's really snowballed. Now it's become an international effort involving probably 15 different people. So when you first began to look into this topic, tell me what you were thinking. What were you feeling? What was happening? Well, I probably like most lay persons in the country. I was thinking this doesn't exist anymore. Um, it, it's not really a problem. These people are making a mountain out of a molehill. Um, it's, it's maybe a, it's a political statement people are making now. It doesn't really exist. Um, However, having spent a year researching it now, it's quite prevalent and it goes on. There was a real good paper written, it's called Hiding Right Under Our Nose, because they're probably around us every day, especially in Florida. Now, when the occasional human trafficking story does make news, and one did just recently make news, um, a situation out of Long Island, I believe it was, um, it, it does always seem to be someplace else. And your research is showing you that it's, it's as significant a problem in Florida, or perhaps an even more significant problem in Florida than in other parts of the country? Well, I th Florida is the number three place by most estimations if for the amount of trafficking that goes on. Um, the United Nations, the State Department, and a researcher named Kevin Bales independently and using different objective criteria tried to estimate worldwide how many cases there were. Now, all three of them came up with between 27 and 28 million examples a year of people involved in human trafficking. Now, it, I'm it, sorry, run, run that number past 27 me? million worldwide. Wow. Um, the CIA it estimates that 50,000 people are trafficked into the United States every year. Um, other estimates are lower than that. Most of them are around 18 to 20,000. Um, the percentage coming into Florida is, you know, smaller than that, but we're still by all counts and measures number three in the nation for the amount of cases and victims. Um, the Miami airport, for example, is the number three location in the country for bringing victims in. Okay, now let's break down what we're talking about because, again, these stories are not making headlines. When they do, it's infrequent. Um, people have a tendency to think that when you mention human trafficking, somebody has been kidnapped or shanghaied and, exactly. and, and brought into the country, you know, like just snatched off the street. And that's not really the situation, although that it does happen. That Every possible scenario you can imagine is, is happening and is possible. Um, what drives and fuels human trafficking is 
poverty and destitution and desperation. Um, people in poor countries making, you know, for example, the, the most recent case I was involved with, the, the family was making $40 a month. Um, they were approached, they had 10 children, the family was approached, they said, if, you know, send your daughter to America, she can work in our house as a maid, we'll pay her $400 a month, which is uh, significantly more than the, the father of the family was making in Guatemala. Once she got here, she was basically enslaved. And once they're caught up in that, their identification is taken from them. They don't generally speak the language. They have little contact with the outside world. They're uneducated. And they're essentially defenseless, and they're pawns of their captors. Um, they're, what we're looking at now are there, there are countries that are import countries, and there are, there are countries that are export countries. And all you have to do is look at the gross national product of each country, and you'll know what they are. Um, the affluent countries bring people in. The poor, destitute countries are sending people out. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, I believe you said she was, the victim was from Guatemala? Yes. Okay. So she was brought over to work as a domestic servant? Okay. Three, the three big categories that we have in Florida are domestic servitude, people who are working as domestic servants, um, agricultural laborers, farm workers, and that, that's been a problem in Florida since Florida has been in existence. Um, we've always had a problem with a, a huge undocumented migrant labor population that work for little or no wages that are essentially working for slave wages. And then of course the sex industry is the third big area that human trafficking is prevalent in Florida. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, the, the exporting countries and one of the avenues um, for human trafficking. Um, I told you that I have a friend that works with the State Department. He's at the embassy in Mexico and he was explaining about how when illegal immigrants try to come into this country, the system for getting them into the country is now extremely sophisticated and has a stepped um, criteria. criteria. Right, so that for, for each leg of the journey the um, the illegal that's coming in has to pay more and more and more money until when they get to their destination they have a debt that they cannot repay and so then they become indentured servants and you said well no I would call that slavery. Yeah, I would call it slavery. I mean human trafficking is, is a politically correct term that's a little bit more palatable than slavery but I don't see this any different than the slavery that went on 200 years ago or that went on 2,000 years ago. It, it's holding it, the, the litmus test to me is if you're holding somebody against their will and they don't have the freedom or the opportunity to leave, that's slavery. Well, I asked my friend from the State Department if the State Department did consider that human trafficking and he said that yes, they do. So that's one of the ways that people are brought into the, you, you've laid out one, that the, the desperately poor family will in, essence sell a child. Um, it would be the illegal immigrant who is trying to get into the country and ends up um, in debt. And then um, when we talk about particularly victims that are somehow attached to the sex trade, that's where the whole kidnapping idea comes it's in. It's not just kidnapping, it can be mail order brides. I okay. mean, the technology and the internet has facilitated this industry uh, greatly because um, you can do a Google search for internet brides or brides from Russia and you'll get pages and pages of, of companies providing that. There's 5,000 travel agencies in Florida and they facilitate bringing people in internationally every day. Uh, some of those people come here under false pretenses once they get here, if, especially if their identification is taken from them, especially if they don't have any money, then they're put to work. A lot of them will be told they're going to come here to do one thing. They end up working in adult entertainment clubs or here in Orlando there's a big problem that the Metropolitan Bureau of Investigation has been investigating for the last several years. They have a special task force in massage parlors. Mm -hmm. um, they'll bring especially women from eastern countries, Thailand and places like that, to Orlando. Uh, they'll rotate them around to different states and they'll work in massage parlors and they end up performing sex acts um, for a much greater salary than what they would have made back in Thailand. The problem that the NBI has run into is they'll identify a victim, they'll identify a perpetrator, they'll make a case, but the victim will refuse to testify. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for that. One could be a phenomenon known as the Stockholm Syndrome, where the longer you're held in captivity with somebody, you come to identify with your captor and that you see them as your guardian even, mm -hmm. and so you're very unwilling to turn on them. Um, another psychological aspect of it is the captors tell the victims that the police are their enemy. If you go to the police, they're going to deport you, they're going to arrest you for drug use, they're going to arrest you for prostitution, and traditionally that's what the police are trained to do. If you see a law being violated, you make an arrest. 
So if the police are making an arrest for prostitution or drug use and they don't correctly identify the victim as having been brought here against their, his or her will, then they're playing into the hands of the people who are doing the trafficking. And that's one of the things that you're helping the FDLE with is um, developing protocols so that law enforcement can identify when there is potentially a victim of human trafficking in front of them. Yeah, what, we're, what the FDLE study is, is a three-pronged study. Stage one, we're simply surveying all of the sheriff's agencies in all 67 counties in Florida to find out the extent of the problem, how they deal with it, to describe to us some, some cases that they may have. Um, phase two, I've got a, a group of 10 um, undergraduate students and two graduate students who are, some of them are trained interviewers and they're all bilingual. We have a person who speaks Mandarin Chinese, several who speak different Spanish dialects, um, one who speaks Ukrainian. Um, once we've identified victims, they're going to go out and interview the victims. Um, it's preferable to have young students do it because that's less intimidating than the police. They speak their language, they're close to the same age. So hopefully from that process we'll garner enough information that in the second year, phase three of the project, FDLE will develop training protocols that they can go statewide with and train officers, you know, not just command level officers, but officers on the street to identify cases when they run across them. Now, is it just lucky that you would happen to have such a mix of graduate students available to you that you're able to utilize them in this way? Yeah, they're un actually undergraduates. I have okay, 10 undergraduates. Uh, UCF has an outstanding Office of Undergraduate Research where they have all kind of research opportunities for undergraduate students. They have a research showcase, for example, where they have poster sessions. Um, I just you know, when you, FDLE first gave me the opportunity, I started talking about it in my research methods undergraduate class, and I said, if, you know, if anybody's interested in this project, you know, see me after class, and, you know, we'll discuss it, and if I can find a role for you, I'll try to facilitate that. Everybody in the class wanted to do it, so I had 100 people wanting to do this wow. in all my different classes, so wow. the response was overwhelming. Um, I found it particularly beneficial working with undergraduates for several different reasons. One, they're here for longer. Most of them are here for three and four years, whereas our master's level students are here for one year. A lot of the graduate students have full-time jobs, they have families, they have other obligations. Undergraduates are here purely for an education. Um, so their youth is also an asset because they have a lot more energy than I do. And they have a dynamic skill set. I mean, I have a, we have a website set up for the study and we have a webmaster who helped design the John Madden football games. Um, why do you think the response to that was so strong among your students? Because, as I said at the beginning, um, when you mention human trafficking to people, it makes them bristle, and they don't want to hear about it because it's just, and it's not, it's not that um, they're rejecting the idea of human trafficking, and they just find the idea so painful that they don't, they don't want to know what's happening. I think people don't acknowledge that it exists in modern day society. Um, the reality is it's more prevalent today than it probably was in the antebellum South prior to the Civil War. Um, the price of a slave in the 1840s was $40,000, which was a, in today's dollars. Um, the price of a slave today is $90. In today's in dollars? In today's dollars. Wow. So the difference in $40,000 and that $90 is huge. And the reason is because of supply and demand. The world is so much more populated today than it was then. There's so many more people who are destitute and desperate today in third world countries than there were then that there's, you know, it's such a commodity the price has gone down and slaves are easy to be replaced. That's why they're treated so poorly. Mm -hmm. At least during the South, the slaves were treated with a little bit, but they were at least fed and taken care of a little bit more, I think, than what the modern victims are. And plus, the modern victims are not viewed as victims. They're not getting the attention that, it, that they did in the antebellum South. So why do you think your students were so enthusiastic in wanting to help with this research? Because I think after we spent a little bit of time talking about it in class and they realized that it really is a problem, it really does exist, it really does go on, most of our students, especially in criminal justice, have a social conscience and they're concerned about the victim, they're concerned about crime victims, they're concerned about the downtrodden, and they want to make a difference in the world. And this was one of the few research opportunities that's a relatively new topic to them that hadn't already been explored and researched to death and it gave them an opportunity to make a difference and do something meaningful. Um, when we talk about the three types of victims, the migrant workers, the domestic servants, and then the massage parlor victims, how do they break down in the state of Florida? Well, you would be surprised. Uh, 
I was surprised anyway. I, I would assume that the agricultural areas would have more of the migrant workers, and they do. But they also, a lot of the sex industry caters to those migrant workers. So a lot of the people who are held in servitude, they'll take them to these migrant, you know, transient camps where people are working in the fields, and they'll service all the workers there. So a lot of the sex trade actually goes on there. We're actually putting together, we're just now starting to get the data in, but we're putting together spot maps that are going to show where the different types of trafficking are occurring throughout the state. So that really does keep it underground. Oh yeah. Uh, there's been numerous cases where the victims would call the police, the police would be called out there, and the police either couldn't communicate with them, they didn't understand what was going on, they believed the people who were holding them captive, and they would simply leave the case. Uh, Florida State University did a big study on human trafficking a couple of years ago, and that was what they found, that victims oftentimes would come into contact with social service providers, uh, especially hospitals, because a lot of these women would become pregnant, they would have to go get abortions, a lot of them would be beat up, um, a lot of them had malnutrition, they would get AIDS, HIV, so they would come into contact with the healthcare industry, but because they didn't speak the language or because they were frightened or for whatever reason, they rarely, if ever, would come forward and explain what was actually going on. Now, when you talk about someone who might be attached to this um, sex trade, then you, um, it, it's easy to understand that, okay, these women are probably being physically abused by their captors or whatever the correct terminology would be. That's easy to see. When you talk about somebody who is being kept as a domestic servant, that's where I think people have a much more difficult time accepting that there is overt abuse taking place. And it's abuse that's coming from people with very deep pockets. Um, the case from Long Island that I mentioned, those folks were living in a house that was valued at $1.5 million, and the woman that escaped from their home, and they had two, women in their home. One escaped and um, she had very visible signs of physical abuse all over her body. There was an identical case in South Florida recently too. They, it was an affluent family in Palm Beach. They had, they had brought a person in to serve as a servant essentially and they ended up keeping her in a state of captivity. They took all of her possessions, they took her passport, she had no means of communication with her family, and they basically held her as a slave. So while I'm interested in, you had, you had made a reference that Perhaps some slaves in the antebellum South had it better than slaves today. Slavery is never good. Right. They, they didn't have it good, but at least the people in the northern states had sympathy and they knew about it and there was a whole movement, the Underground Railroad, and the slaves were a political lightning rod. I mean, we fought a war over that. Mm -hmm. it, they were very much in the forefront of public thought. Today is kind of an underground phenomenon that people are not aware of, people are not talking about, people are not addressing the issue. Slavery is still slavery. It was just as bad then to be a slave as it is today, but it was more out in the open then and people were trying to do something about it. Today it's more of a hidden phenomenon. There's a, a saying we have in criminal justice is about crime that is called the dark figure of crime because the police know about 10 or 12 percent of crime. The majority of crimes they're never made aware of. Slavery is the same way. What we see is we see the tip of the iceberg. We see a few isolated cases. Uh, the numbers I gave you early earlier today, the CIA estimates 50,000 people are brought into the United States a year. There's only been 20 cases prosecuted in Florida in the last 10 years. So there's a huge disparity between the apparent number of victims and the number of cases that are being brought to trial and the people who are getting punished for this. So that's what I mean by there's a difference between today and what it was in the antebellum South, because today it's a hidden phenomenon and we're not doing a good enough job addressing it. I remember reading a story a couple of years ago about an investigator, and I don't remember which agency he was with. He may have been with the FBI or the CIA, but he was the guy charged with um, trying to eliminate human trafficking. And, uh, and apparently he, what, he did some rather significant work during his tenure, and he invested 10 or 20 years into this. And then it just got the better of him. He just couldn't take the stories anymore. It would be like working with child abuse and pedophiles. You know, I don't think I would have the stomach for that either. It would be it's a very disheartening job. And I'm, a, I'm a novice at this. I've been doing it for a year. There's other people, Kevin Bales in particular, we were fortunate enough to have him at UCF two weeks ago. You know, he spent his whole lifetime studying this. And you know, I really have to admire people like that who have the courage to do that, because it is depressing. So where will your research go? You, you're only um, in the beginning stages of your research. Where, what is your goal here? Because we've spoken, for instance, you said you made a visit to South Africa 
and you were stunned um, by the constant warnings in South Africa about human trafficking. Yeah, it was much more out in the open in South Africa than it is here. Um, I went to South Africa to do a program evaluation in the Department of Social Work and Criminal Justice at the University of Pretoria. And as soon as I walked in the door to their conference room, all I saw was all these posters all the wall about human trafficking. And their faculty have been involved with doing research on human trafficking for years now. Um, so it was really eye-opening to me to see this going on. You'd be riding down the road in, in South Africa and there would be street signs that say, do not stop, you know, it's a kidnap area. Because if you broke down and you stopped, you'd be kidnapped and taken. And this is out by the townships, out, you know, out in the countryside. But it's very, very much of a problem there and has been for a number of years. So South Africa is an exporting country, but I had always thought of South Africa. Now, South Africa actually has them brought in from Mozambique and Zimbabwe okay. and places around that because they're more affluent. That's South what Africa I was going to say. Affluent. Yeah, they, yes. they're, they're an importing country, I would say. Okay, so but the, but there are warnings about being kidnapped. Right. Well, they still it still happens there. Um, I traveled by motorcycle when I was in South Africa, mm -hmm. and everybody was telling me, be very careful if you are approached by gangs of young men, leave because you know you could be kidnapped and held for ransom or whatever. Um, so there are, there are raiding parties that come in from other countries into South Africa, and the South African townships themselves are also very poor, mm -hmm. and that's where these signs would be located because mm -hmm. it's a very high-risk area there. Now, what, what was happening with these victims? Are they um, going into the same you know, three areas that we've discussed, or are these um, victims that you, we hear sometimes stories about children um, being taken for military right. use, they get thrown into uh, some revolutionary army yeah. or something like that. That's an additional aspect that they have to deal with in the continent of Africa that fortunately we don't have to deal with here, but mm -hmm. that's definitely the case there. So you did see some of that. So now what, you are going to continue doing some work in developing some protocols for South Africa as well as yeah, for the in FDLE. Fact, I, I was speaking with them today. Everything that we're doing here with FDLE, we're replicating in South Africa. The University of Pretoria, for example, is going to be giving out the same survey that we're using here to all the South African police, police agencies. Um, then they're going to be going out and interviewing victims. And they're going to do what's called a replication. Everything we do here, they're going to do the exact same thing down there. And what that does, and we also, Mike Reynolds, another faculty member in our department, has expressed an interest in doing the same thing in Turkey and Russia. Mm -hmm. So the more places we do it, the more basis for comparison we have. And then we can get a better idea and get a better empirical research handle on what's really going on because again there's that huge disparity between the supposed number of victims and the number of cases brought to law enforcement. Are there things that the average person can keep an eye out for um, and recognize whether they may have crossed paths with a human trafficking situation? Is that something the average person can be vigilant about? I would think so. Just use common sense, especially in truck stops, rest stops on the side of the interstate, any place where there's a lot of migrant people that are you know, going by, keep an eye on it. If you see small children who seem to be being abused, and the problem, a big part of it is language barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things I would like to stress is that you know, we have a research team that has a lot of linguistic skills. It's hard to put that on a police department. Uh, the MBI here in Orlando spent quite a bit of money paying for interpreters to talk to these ladies from Thailand, and they never could convince them to turn state's evidence. Had they turned state's evidence, they could have gotten what's called a, a T visa and stayed in the United States legally. But they're so scared of the police because of what the traffickers have brainwashed them into thinking that they don't cooperate with law enforcement. So then what happens? The cycle never, it just repeats itself all over again and they stay in, in the victimization and when they're, the vic traffickers are through with them, they bring in more women to replace them. Do we know which are the largest exporting countries and which are the largest importing countries? Again, like I said earlier, if you just look at the gross national product of a country, the poorer the country is, the more likely they are to be an export country. The more affluent the country is, the more likely they are to be an import country. And, and that, like Florida's number three in the country, it pretty much goes with the financial status of the United States. New York, California, and Florida are the top three. Wow. Well, listen, there's a lot more we could talk about on this subject, and I really hope that we do get the opportunity, but unfortunately, we're out of time okay. right now. So thank you very much okay. for well, joining me today. Um, me. I've been speaking with Dr. Mark Lanier from the Department of Criminal Justice and Legal Studies within UCF's College of Health and Public Affairs. And that's it for now. I'm Alicia Callanay-Mandigo. Thanks for watching Public Affairs Today.